All right, mates, how's it going? In today's video, I'm covering Nether Dragons, Shadow of the Light, and Dirge of the North from Chronicle Volume 3. So let's go. The journey to Outland had a profound impact on a lot of peeps. Not just those from the Horden Alliance, but also other beings from Azeroth as well. For example, the blue dragon Tiragosa. She'd visited the Shattered Realm and come across a brood of creatures called Nether Dragons, and they all became best mates. But where the bloody hell did they come from, you ask? Well, remember how Deathwing had left a load of his eggs on Draenor, and then the world exploded? The influx of energy from that explosion warped the unhatched eggs into partially incorporeal beings. Although they were powerful, these nether dragons were also a little bit childish, laughing at jokes about farts and dicks and stuff. They had no true leader, which made them a little bit unruly as well. And it also made them pretty easy to manipulate, which did unfortunately happen to them. A renegade death knight called Ragnok Bloodreaver decided he wanted to use the nether dragons to form an army one which would help him conquer the Shattered Realm. Although he failed miserably, his abuse of the Nether Dragons had lasting effects. They'd suffered many injuries whilst fighting under Ragnot's banner, and Tiragosa was a little bit worried they might die from them. So she transported many of the Nether Dragons to the lair of the Blue Dragonflight, the Nexus, hoping that the energies within would reinvigorate them. What she didn't consider was whether the Blue Dragons would be safe from them. The Nether Dragons bathed in the arcane energy of the Nexus, and they bloody loved it. They wanted it all. It made them even stronger, and with that kind of power, there'd never be another Ragnok Blood Reaver, taking advantage of them and stuff. So they launched a surprise attack against the Blue Dragons, and attempted to seize the Nexus for themselves. And the ensuing battle drew the attention of Malagos himself. Malagos had been hiding within the Nexus for thousands of years, pretty much ever since Naltharion had first shown his true colours, and gained himself the name Deathwing. His slaughter of the Blue Dragonflight had caused Malagos to lose his mind a little bit. He no longer cared about what was happening in the outside world, and he didn't give a crap about his duties as the Guardian of Arcane Magic, either. If there were any anomalies out there, his servants would usually take care of it anyway, so whatevs. But he couldn't ignore an attack on his own lair. He lashed out at the Nether Dragons and basically just absorbed them all into his being. And by doing so, the haze of suffering and regret that had clouded his mind for thousands of years was swept away. He was now convinced that he needed to embrace his sacred duty of safeguarding magic on Azeroth again. However, this wasn't necessarily a good thing. After assessing the state of magical affairs on the world, he drew a fairly extreme conclusion. Mortals are foolish, and their use of magic leads to nothing but war and chaos. So he formed a plan to sever the link between mortals and the latent arcane energy coursing through the world, and we'll come back to that another time. Meanwhile, Cho'Gall had been busy, continuing to expand the Twilight's Hammer Cult. It was now something very different to the Orcish clan it had once been. For example, they were less racist now. They welcomed members from all races and walks of life. And in doing so, the cult had infiltrated pretty much every major city on Azeroth, and they were still growing. A particularly easy target for conversion to their cause were survivors of the Third War, especially those who witnessed the horrors of Lordaeron. Archbishop Benedictus, leader of the Church of the Holy Light, was one such individual. He'd lived through the First and Second Wars, and he'd seen some shit, man, but his faith had remained intact. The Third War, however, not so much. The fall of Lordaeron and the appearance of the Scourge pushed his conviction to breaking point. Why had the Holy Light not protected Prince Arthas, or King Terranas, or the Paladins, or any of the other good people of the kingdom? Why in the balls didn't it do anything? Cultists learned of the Archbishop's uncertainty, and flocked to him like flies to poop. They presented themselves as true believers of the Holy Light, in search of guidance. But then they gradually whittled away at what was left of his beliefs. Did you hear about the Void? It's this universal force of energy that would never abandon its servants. Sounds awful, doesn't it? Benedictus had heard of shadow magic before, Everybody's heard of that, but he'd never used it. It was unholy and corruptive. Or was it? Maybe that wasn't true, and he'd just been led to believe that. It was this curiosity that opened the way to the old gods. They whispered in his dreams and showed him the light as they saw it. Not some benevolent force, but an authoritarian thing that wanted order and obedience. He continued to have these dreams for many nights, and they culminated in a vision of the Hour of Twilight. Seeing this made him cry a little bit, but not because he was scared or shocked by this apocalypse. It moved him. It was beautiful. It was a chance to break free from the Holy Light's tyranny, and create a new world where he'd be the master of his own destiny. At that point, he decided that the Old Gods and the Void were the natural state of the universe, and the Light was only a means to deny that reality, which was wrong. The Void was not the source of lies, but every possible truth, so he went ahead and pledged his life to it. He joined the Twilight's Hammer Cult, becoming one of its most influential members, and he changed his name to Pyromancer. Just kidding, he, he didn't do that. He remained head of the Church of the Holy Light, and through sheer willpower, retained his ability to wield the light as well. 
and this position granted him access to other disillusioned priests that could be recruited into the cult. Chogar was kind of pleased. This was a real triumph for the cult, but he was still a little bit sad about Cthulhu's fall. Now the bloody hell of mortals had the power to defeat an old god. So, whilst the Alliance and Horde had been occupied in Outland, Chogul headed to Northrend and infiltrated Alduar, a prison built by the Keepers for the old god Yog saron Good old Yogi had clouded the minds of Loken and the other ancient Keepers so they didn't even notice Chogul as he slipped by. The two-headed ogre willingly chipped away at the old god's enchanted bonds. He couldn't break them, but he did manage to weaken the chains, and it was enough to increase yogg influence over the Keepers tenfold. Although they'd been kinda under his sway anyway, his grasp on them had been tenuous. But not anymore. Yogg-Saron immediately commanded Loken to use the Forge of Wills to forge an army, and the extraordinary machine churned out a whole bunch of metal-skinned dwarfs and Vrykul that just wanted a murder. Whilst they fortified the surrounding lands around Olduar, Chogul thought to himself, my work here is done. Yogg-Saron was going to need some time, and Chogul knew that the Alliance and Horde posed a real threat to the Old God if they continued to put aside their differences. They'd already managed to defeat one Old God, so they could probably do it again. He was going to need to drive a wedge between them somehow. And pretty soon he's going to have a good opportunity to do that. Meanwhile again, in Kalimdor, an orc named Rhaegar Earthfury had come across a young human bloke who had no memory of who he was or where he'd come from. And rather than just murdering this young bloke, he decided to enslave him and make him fight as a gladiator. It didn't take long for this human to win renown for his ferocious fighting style. He even earned the moniker Logosh, a name the Tauren had given to the wild god, Goldrin, the White Wolf. Just like Goldrin, this human possessed unparalleled rage and fury and I don't know why I'm being so bloody mysterious about him, it's Varian, innit? And we're leaving it there! In the next Volume 3 video, Varian Rin thinks he's a wolf, and Chogol's plan to get the two factions hating each other again comes to fruition. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, all of that bollocks, and all that's left to say is, thanks for watching, and see ya!